On March the 1st, 1921, the Kronstadt naval base on the Kotland Islands, 25 miles from Petrograd, adopted a 15-point programme of political and economic demands, a programme in the open defiance of the Bolshevik party's control of the Soviet state. Almost immediately, the Bolsheviks denounced the uprising as a white guard plot, another in the series of counter-revolutionary conspiracies that had beleaguered the Soviet regime during the three preceding years of civil war. Less than three weeks later, on March the 17th, Kronstadt was subdued in a bloody assault by the select Red Army units. The Kronstadt uprising, to all appearances, had been little more than a passing episode in the bitter history of the Civil War. We can now say that the Kronstadt uprising marked the definitive end of the Russian Revolution itself. The character and importance of the uprising were destined to become issues of acrimonious dispute within the international left for years to come. The Kronstadt uprising posed very far-reaching issues. The relationship between the so-called masses and the parties which professed to speak in their name, and the nature of the social system in the Soviet Union. The Kronstadt uprising remains as a lasting challenge to the Bolshevik concept of a party's historical function and the notion of the Soviet Union as a workers' or socialist state. The Kronstadt sailors were no ordinary military body. They were the famous Red Sailors of 1905, 1917 and the Civil War. By common consent, until the Bolsheviks began to revise history after the uprising, the Kronstadt sailors were regarded as the most reliable and politicised military elements of the newly established Soviet regime. Kronstadt had arisen as a result of a strike movement in Petrograd, a near uprising by the Petrograd proletariat. The demands of the Kronstadt sailors were not formulated in the fastness of an isolated island in the Gulf of Finland. They were developed as a result of the close contact between the naval base and the restless Petrograd workers, whose demands the 15-point program essentially articulated. What were these demands? New elections to the Soviets, freedom of speech for the anarchists and the left socialist parties, free trade unions and peasant organisations, the liberation of anarchist and socialist political prisoners. Economic and institutional demands focused on a loosening of the stringent trade restrictions imposed by the period of war communism. The demands of the Kronstadt sailors were the very minimum needed to rescue the revolution from bureaucratic decay and economic strangulation. Ordinarily, there are two histories of revolutions. The first comprises the official history, a history which turns around the conflicts of parties, factions and the leaders. The other, in the words of the Russian anarchist, Voline may be called the Unknown Revolution, the rarely written accounts of the independent and creative action by the revolutionary people. The social history of the revolution turned around the fate of the factory committees and village assemblies, not simply around conflicting armies and duels between the Bolsheviks and their political opponents. The factory committees demanded and for a brief period acquired full control over industrial operations. Lenin distrusted them completely after October, as early as January 1919, only two months after decreeing workers' control of the factories, the Bolshevik leader moved into open opposition to the committees. In Lenin's view, the revolution demanded precisely in the interests of socialism and that the masses unquestionably obey the single will of the leaders of the labour process. Workers' control was sharply denounced not only as inefficient, chaotic and impractical, but as a petty bourgeois and anarcho-syndicalist deviation. The Bolshevik party did not make the Russian Revolution, it dominated the revolution and thereby strangled it. It played no role whatever in February 1917, when Tsarism was overthrown. In October, eight months later, the party took power for itself, not on behalf of the Soviets or the factory committees. During the debates that were to determine the fate of the factory committees, the left communist Asinki warned his party Socialism and socialist organisation must be set up by the proletariat itself or they will not be set up at all. Something else will be set up. State capitalism. The warning, delivered in the early days of the revolution, was prophetic. It would be an utter absurdity to claim that a state apparatus which divests the workers of any control over society can be regarded as a workers' state. All the conditions for Stalinism were prepared by the defeat of the Kronstadt sailors and the Petrograd strikers. We may choose to lament these popular movements, to honour the heroism of the victims, to inscribe their efforts in the annals of the revolution, 
But above all, the Konstat revolt and the strike movement in Petrograd must be understood if we are to grasp the content of the revolutionary process itself.